Hey, you, wherever you are in the world right now, thank you so much for being here with me. We know that we're living in some crazy times and we know that the world is changing. So let's create a bridge as we travel through one another's countries, removing all the labels, coming together as one people, finding our home in this one world. And as we do this, this is why our signature talk today is so important. Today, I am so excited to welcome my guest speaker. Her name is Christy Martin. Hi, Christy. Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. I just have to say this is a really great honor. Thank you so much for being here. Christy is a life transformation coach. She's an energy worker who encourages women to rediscover themselves and their magic through human design, spirituality, energy healing, adventure, and creativity. I love all of this stuff that you're doing with women. It's so incredible. And I know that you have an amazing story that we can talk about probably for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. But what I would love to do is just take a step back and let's get into, you know, where this started for you as far as being a life transformation coach. How did this start for you, Christy? That's a great question. Um, really, and you know, my journey goes back a while, but it's really at the beginning of this year, actually almost last year after, um, you know, do you want me to go back all the way to the beginning of my story? <laughs> Wherever you're comfortable starting. Let me, cause this is going to provide a lot of backstory. So I, um, really through a young adulthood. So I graduated high school 18 and um, I've been with my husband for a very long time, wonderful man, but I got into a marriage and um, being a mom very young. So I was married at the age of 20. I became a mom at the age of 21. And that literally was all I wanted was to be a mom, was to fill my life with love and children and be surrounded by people. Because growing up, I had great parents, but um, they were young parents as well. And they had to work a lot. So I was with babysitters a lot or on my own a lot. And I was, I was okay with that. And that very much just... Um, independent, like, okay, I'm just going to go do my own thing um, and figure it out. And I'm still like that today. But so, you know, that kind of gives you an idea of me. So then coming into um, young adulthood again, so got married, started having kids. I wanted to have tons and tons of kids. And we did. I'm the mom of five boys now. <laughs> and so, you know, but back then we had our first one. And I also uh, was a nurse at the time. So I just graduated nursing school, started my career there working in the emergency room, and I 100% loved it. Um, you know, uh, you imagine the emergency room environment, and you know, probably it's chaotic. We're dealing with, you know, lots of things on the daily from very severe, from life altering, you know, life and death things, you know, all the way down to just broken bones and colds and things like that. So and um, it was just, it was the most beautiful experience that I had. And I had this label on myself, this label of nurse, and I was so proud of it. And I was so um, just lit up by what I did and helping other people and getting to go every day and just maybe change somebody's life or help be a part of something that saved a life or just just literally anything. So you can see how much I absolutely love that. But at the same time, when you think about this, um, and this is true for many healthcare professionals, and I didn't realize this until years later, until almost recently, but um, this kind of, it was very traumatic. It was very traumatic um, for my brain, for the body. And like I said, these aren't things till I realized till later when I would be dealing with um, maybe irrational fears of things or um, you know, I had this horrible fear with my children when we're out at the lake that like somebody's going to drown. And I didn't until years later put this into consideration that it's from everything that I had seen and the trauma that I had been through with my career. So I think that that's really important to mention too, because often even the nurses that I, my former coworkers, when I mention it now and talk about, you know, we've been through some really traumatic experiences. Have you considered that we're suffering from trauma just from our jobs? And many of them don't think of it that way. So 
I think that it's it's really important to to point on that and to say that it's okay if you're you're traumatized by something that happened on the job or by you know somebody that you lost or or anything like that um and we're digressing a little there but so I did that I was in my job for 10 years and um then very unexpectedly my youngest would have been one at the time my boys would have been one two three five and seven so they're very close together too. Um, I was in a part of a mass layoff and that that really rocked my world because again, we talked about these labels. I had labeled myself growing up, nurse, mom, wife, uh, daughter. And that's all I knew was these labels. Who was I without that label of nurse? I was a mom. So I kind of threw myself into that to just okay, being a mom, I'm going to raise these kids and I'm I'm going to give them everything. I'm going to give them every piece of me. And if you're a mom, you know how much we love our kids and we do that. But, um, you know, I lost myself in the process. And I, you know, I know with many other mothers, especially, you know, younger mothers or things like that, it's, it's a common story that I've heard. So, Um, On top of all of that, I lost the career and I was happy to be a stay at home mom because that's where we originally had planned on as my husband advanced his career, I would stay home, but I wasn't prepared for it. (laughs) I was not at all prepared for all the things that came with it. Um, So not only with the layoff, I also decided at the same time, I've also been overweight much of my life. So I decided at the same time um, that I was going to go ahead and have gastric bypass surgery as well. I thought, oh, this is something I've been thinking about. Now I have time off of work. I'm going to go through with that. And so I went through with that. And at the same time, so within a month, all three of these things are happening. We moved to another town. We moved to a town that was about 30 minutes away from where I grew up, where all of our friends were, our family, our support. So 30 minutes doesn't sound really far away. You know, that's what we thought at the time, but it was also up into kind of a mountain community. So it's very isolated. We don't have, you know, stores or restaurants or anything around us. So it is a drive to get to anywhere, anything that you want to do. I, oh man. So talk about your world just really being rocked. And at this point I was 28, 29, right in there. So right at the age of that Saturn return as well. And I just really lost myself. So after gastric bypass, I, I was losing the weight on the outside. Lots of things were changing for me on my outside physical appearance. I, you know, was looking better. I was getting attention from people, from other men, from um, women, from anybody. Oh, you look so great. Like you're looking so great. What have you done? And, um, and that was just it was something that I've never dealt with before and I didn't know how to handle it. So while I was having all these changes happening on the inside, the internal things weren't changing. The internal things were staying the same. This still kind of, who am I? This, um, you know, I still look in the mirror and I still see the same person. I still see, um, you know, this person maybe with all the weight on her that's been hiding, that's been insecure, that's been avoidant that um is scared to interact with the life I really realized that and so kind of going through all these things being isolated being a mom that was completely overwhelmed you know five children that depend on you any amount of children that depend on you sometimes it's really hard especially when you're having your own struggles of you know, mental health or loss of identity or loss of career and just really trying to figure out who the heck are you because you are more than a mom. You are more than a daughter. You are more than a wife. You're more than that label. Like, yes, you have that label. You wear that hat, but you're so much more than that. And I didn't know who I was, who, you know, so just think of this person that's just like extremely lost and trying to raise these children and just trying to do her best. But, um, I just really kind of went off the rails. So I began drinking and at first it was really fun. You know, I think that that's everybody's kind of experience a lot of times with alcohol and the way that it's portrayed in media. I could really get on a rant about that. <laughs> the the alcohol culture that we have and the way that it's portrayed as fun and, and normalized. 
Um, so that was kind of my experiences with it when I started drinking. This makes me really fun. This makes me really uh, smart, I had good things to say. It made me really outgoing. It made me to where I felt like I could have a conversation with somebody um, and I could be interesting and funny and pretty. And I didn't realize that all of those things were already inside of me that um, and I didn't need alcohol to access those things and touch on them. Um, so I continued this very, very dangerous dance with alcohol. It quickly spiraled to, you know, where I was just drinking on the weekends to where it was every night. And then it was every morning because, you know, when you wake up with the shakes and with withdrawing, um, you know, if you've ever had that experience, it's it was this terrible, um, just this horrible feeling. So it would be like, okay, we drink again to get rid of that. And it just really spiraled from there. So in the midst of all of that, I was also doing just some part-time nursing and um, just really lost myself. That's that's where it really went. Um, I was having trouble in my marriage because of the alcohol addiction. I was making really poor choices, drinking and driving, um, sometimes with my kids. I one time um, got in an argument with my husband and we went and I took the kids and rented a hotel room and um, you know left them up there and he came to find us and I forgot where the kids were. We had to go to the front desk and find out where I had checked out the room. And I mean, these horrible, horrible things um, that I was just spiraling. I had no regard for my own life and no regard for the life of others. And it all finally came to a head one day when I got into a car accident. Thank God I was on my own for that one. And, um, you know, my husband kind of said, it's, we can't do this anymore. So, um, you have to go get help. And I didn't want to go get help. I knew I needed help. I knew that, um, the space that I was in, I mean, drinking all the time, drinking and driving, I don't care for my life. I don't care for the lives of others, obviously. Um, and, you know, and this was also after things like I had developed some suicidal ideation and depression, and I would do things like, um, telling my husband, don't go to work today, because if you do, I might kill myself or I might cut myself, I might self-harm. And so I just, I was just really in this place where I felt hopeless. I felt isolated. I felt so alone. I felt like nobody could understand what I was going through, how I was feeling, how I was um, overwhelmed, how I didn't no, um, I felt like a child myself sometimes still. And I, I beat myself up for that because I thought, oh, you're, you're supposed to be a parent. You're supposed to be an adult. You're supposed to have this figured out. And I didn't, I still don't. So <laughs> I don't think that that changed, but um, I think that realizing that we don't have to have it figured out and that um, it's okay to just do the best that we're doing at any moment. And are you doing the best you can? Have you have you taken an experience like that? And did you learn from it? Have you changed? Um, you know, so with all of that, it came to a head and I ended up going to uh, rehab for 30 days. And let me tell you, that was, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, you know, I was there and I was very, I was very selfish about it. I um, showed up there. I didn't want to be there in the first place because um, I had to go for 30 days. I had to leave my kids. I had to leave my husband. I was four hours away. I was very worried about um, what are they going to eat? Are you going to feed them pizza and McDonald's the whole time? Are you are you going to do homework the way that I did it? So um, it was just all of these things. And I was very angry. And I remember my second day there where I was sharing with one of the counselors. I told her, I can't be here. I have to go home. Like, I can't do this. My kids aren't going to survive 30 days without me and this and that. And she said something that kind of rocked my world. She told me, um, she was, you're being very egocentric and selfish. She goes, do you think that their world and your world like revolves around you? She goes, they're going to be fine without you. And that like, I was, of course, I was kind of mad at first because I was like, well, of course their world revolves around me. They're going to eat McDonald's and pizza for a month now. Like who's going to make sure that they're eating broccoli? And, you know, um, but I had to, I mean, that really got me thinking and um, because I had 
called my husband and told him, I'm not staying. Like you guys can't do this 30 days without me and this and that. And after she told me that, um, it really shifted my perspective. And I thought, wow, um, that is kind of egocentric. Why, why would they not, uh, you know, why would they not be okay without me? Like they are going to be okay without me because I'm here right now getting my stuff together. I'm here right now um, figuring out how to stop drinking, figuring out why I'm drinking, because that was a lot of it too, is just like, why am I drinking? And I always came back to just, well, I feel overwhelmed or I deserve it or nobody deserves to put poison into their body. Um, you know, and I like to say too, alcohol is not a form of self-care and I treated it that way. I had a really hard day with the kids. I deserve a drink. I, you know, if it's been a really bad day, I, of course I deserve to drink. Um, so changing that, changing my idea of what self-care was or what healthy, you know, choices could be made to overcome that stress and that overwhelm. But yeah, so I called my husband after the counselor had told him that and, or told me that and said, I have to stay. Like, I don't want to stay for this 30 days because I don't want to be away from my family. And I am, you know, worried about it, but now I realize I have to be here. So I went through that 30 days. Um, one of the hardest things I ever did. It was, it was an interesting experience. Um, you know, learning more about myself, learning how to overcome, um, addiction, learning how to dive into our emotions, because that's a lot of what they started, um, talking about diving into emotions, into, um, into handling conflict. And that's something that I've always run away from or always numbed my emotions. I don't like to talk about those things. So really diving into all of that set a foundation for me, um, starting alcohol and non meetings, learning about Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, this was all new things to me, learning to share your story with other people and being worried about judgment being worried about, um, you know, the things that you did. And so within that space, a lot of healing happened because, you know, there are many of us who had similar stories, many of us who are carrying these shadows around. And when we think of shadows, we often think of them as a bad thing. We often think as of, you know, things like addiction, depression, suicide, mental health struggles, um, getting relapsing, any of those, any of those things that, you know, we consider almost shameful or that we don't um, maybe like those pieces of us, we consider them the shadow. And I think that um, instead of denying that, we can integrate that into ourselves. So it was really a space of being and other people who were dealing with shadows as well and us really starting to bring those to light. So like I said, it set a foundation and I finished up rehab and I left and I was dropped right back into home life. So it was very, very easy while in rehab to um, stay sober because you're in a very controlled environment. Um, so I, and I highly recommend that if, you know, somebody is struggling with addiction and you need that removal from your environment, rehab is a great, great option. And like I said, it set a foundation for me, but I didn't realize coming back when I dropped back into my same environment of kind of overwhelm, I didn't know how to cope again. So um, if you imagine somebody kind of white knuckling it through their sobriety for a couple of months, and, you know, dropped back into not knowing how to handle the overwhelm of um, just caring for the children, being responsible for so many people while also not knowing how to set necessarily boundaries and structure for myself. I've found that that's something I struggle with setting that for myself, which in turn has led to struggling with setting that for my children. So couple of months out of rehab, I relapsed again. Um, and I immediately got a DUI. And that time I had my kids with me. So um, I got to go spend the night in jail and um, got to go navigate a court system and child abuse classes and the loss of my nursing license. So I really, at this point, felt like I was at the lowest of the low. Like, is there any lower that I could get at this point? I've completely destroyed um, everything that I had worked for, you know? I mean, my family, I still had my family. So I can't say that um, 
I destroyed nearly everything, but um, I was just in that really hopeless space of like, what now, you know, what now I've destroyed everything. And um, so it really just became this process of rebuilding from the ground up. Um, I was in Alcoholics Anonymous for a little while and kind of fell out of that um, for different reasons. And then I found myself really um, kind of in this service and volunteering space. I started running a nonprofit foundation for one of our uh, local school districts. And and that's where I really began to find myself again is by um, kind of getting outside of myself, getting outside of my head, getting outside of the chatter that went on. And I see where this is a lot of like the foundation and the premise of AA as well. That's one of the things like um, when you really go in, they really encourage you to start giving of service. So whether you're, you know, emptying ashtrays or you're just preparing coffee, whether you decide to take on a bigger role of leading the meetings, things like that, um, that was something that they really were passionate about. And so I found mine again, outside a different way. And I, and I could understand because it gave you a way to get outside of yourself, to help other people, to um, just give yourself a mission. And that was what it was about for me. So I did that for a couple of years, really started getting involved with my kids and things like PTA and all the nonprofit stuff surrounding our schools. And within that, I started connecting with community, a community of other moms, and that's, again, something that I never had throughout my journey either, is I never let myself, being hyper-independent from my childhood, being very much, a, I don't need people, they're just disappointing, they, um, I can do this myself, I really found myself with no community. So that's something I deliberately started working on, surrounding myself with community, with other moms, with people who understood. And throughout all of that, we're working, working, working. And then we get to last year. So this is about a year before the pandemic starts. And um, I became part of an MLM. So it's a very popular health company. And, and talk about just blowing your mind out of the water of possibility. I have been kind of trudging. I, I like to call it trudging through life, kind of um, half asleep kind of playing the victim, kind of um, just, is this all there is? Um, this, this, I'm not inspired, I'm not motivated, I'm not, I'm here and I'm just living, but I felt like I was standing and watching the world pass me by, you know, and you're just kind of standing and you feel like things are just kind of going by outside the window. So, really last year then diving into this whole new world of possibility where we're um, now today um, more connected by technology more than ever. I started diving into that, seeing more community, seeing the ways in which I could start caring for myself because that was a big story for me too as a mom of five boys. Well, I don't have time to take care of myself. I don't have time to cook proper meals and eat properly. I don't have time to exercise. I don't have time to um, uh, to like leave them. I don't have time. It's not, I had this real big story in my head that it wasn't okay for me to take a break. Um, especially after my addiction and my relapse. It was almost like this martyr syndrome. Like it's, I have to pour everything into these kids and my family. So learning how to pour back into myself again was was so important, um, you know, so it started with just exercise. So, you know, whether it's working out or just going for a walk, getting out in nature, stretching your body. And I started to feel really good. I started to feel really alive again. I started to see the beauty in life again. I started to enjoy my children again. I started to enjoy life again. Um, so, you know, I kept going and I kept going. And, you know, then at the beginning of this year, we had COVID, you know, so we're in the middle of this pandemic. And I, you know, we were talking a little bit before the call and I was telling you so much how I resonate with the way that your journey has taken you this year because um, 
even at the beginning of this year, I really started diving into my internal work, looking at shadow work, starting to do inner child work, exploring why I had the beliefs that I did, exploring why I did some of the things that I did, exploring why um, just all the things, exploring all the things. So it was a really, really heavy period this year that I did of inner work. And there was times where it was like, am I going crazy? There's times where I'm like, am I going to survive this inner work? Um, and just really leaning into that inner work, really leaning into my intuition. Um, growing up too, I have um, an interesting relationship with things like um, religion and um, I don't consider myself super religious. So at the beginning of this year, I also really started deconstructing um, beliefs I've had since I was little. What do I believe in? What, um, what, what world have I constructed for myself versus what I've been told? So it's really been this beautiful journey of self-discovery. Um, and I declared at the beginning of my birthday, my birthday's in February. I said, I'm going to do one new thing a week because um, I'm tired of having excuses. I'm tired of telling myself that um, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Like, no, um, there's a way. So I started my very first thing that I went and did was I went and got a Reiki session done. I've been learning about Reiki, about energy healing, and I was fascinated by it. And I had that done and it, uh, it really was a catalyst for me to start this life transformation journey next. It's taken me 20 minutes to get around to my story of how I became a life transformation coach. <laughs> I promise I'm wrapping up soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, you know, starting at the beginning of this year, it just really evolved into, um, I call it a spiritual awakening for me, a, a life awakening for me of Christy, what are you doing here? Like, what are you just spinning your wheels? You have this incredible platform. You have this message. You're scared to share your message. You don't have confidence in yourself. We understand that. But you have all of these things inside of you that are so untapped that, you know, are incredible. Like, what are you doing? And so this really began a spirit led journey of just like um, leaning in and saying, okay. Um, I'm going to trust. I'm going to tap into my intuition. I'm going to tap into my higher self. I'm going to tap into my higher power, the universe. And I'm just going to go where it takes me. And holy cow, has this been a year, an incredibly transformative year. Um, I started my own podcast back in April and I thought, what am I even going to talk about? So the name of mine is just the self project podcast. And it's literally that it started out all about, I'm just want to help people on their own personal growth journeys. I want to share my story of addiction. I just want to give people hope that like, no matter how you're feeling, like, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling just lost. Like you don't know who you are. You're feeling isolated. You're feeling like nobody understands you. You're feeling however you're feeling that um like that it's okay you're not alone and you can take this story and you're you're going through I, I truly believe and it took me getting outside of this years later I truly believe that everything we go through is absolutely for a reason um we're here to learn a lesson from it um here to maybe help somebody else with it I think that, you know, me not sharing my story of addiction is terrified to share this, um, especially with people that knew me. This is something that I kept very um, kind of closeted. I did not want people to know that I was an alcoholic or recovering alcoholic, that I ever had any problem with it. Um, and so overcoming the shame of that, working through that. And I thought, why did you go through that? You didn't go through that to keep it hidden. You, you went through that because you now need to share. And I like to see myself as kind of a guide with a flashlight that turns around and says, hey, I've been through this. I was right where you are. I went through addiction. I almost killed myself drinking alcohol. You know, there's times that I woke up and I didn't know where I was and just these crazy things that I probably should not have survived. I most definitely had guardian angels on my side half the time through half of this stuff that was going on. But coming the other side of it, it's it's 
truly my hope to kind of shine a flashlight back into the darkness um, for those people who can't see the light, for they can't see the way out, they can't see any hope in the situation. Um, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see the hope. But just knowing, you know, I hope that one person could hear my story and hear like, oh, okay, she got through something similar to me. Like, maybe I can do this. Yeah. So it's, that's my hope. So. It's a I, it's a powerful journey that you've been on, and yeah. that you know, yes, it's it's a long process in your walk and what you've done, and decades, right? This has taken decades to condense into, as you said, 20 minutes or whatever it's been in the process that you've shared. But, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I know somewhere in the world right now, somebody's listening to this and they too are a 20 something year old that's starting a family or, you know, maybe they're in their thirties or forties and they've recognized that they've lost a piece of themselves because they've been so involved in doing everything for everyone else that they've given away everything they have and haven't really kept anything for themselves. If you had advice for your 20 something year old, your 30 something year old, what would the advice be that you would give to, to yourself? I love that. My advice that I would give to my 20 year old self is that there is a world of possibility um, out there. I had really put things into a box. I had really limited myself on, um, you know, what I could do, what I was about, um, what kind of what my purpose was here. So I think that it would really just be about keeping yourself open to that childlike possibility. That's something that has been really powerful for me coming back to. I do have a very childlike personality and actually, um, you know, with my human design, one of my life purposes is just to have new experiences, to experience new things and to share those with other people. And so I... I would tell my 20 year old self those those possibilities and those experiences don't put them in a box because it could literally be anything um, that you are, you know, maybe trying something new, but you speak to a new person, you make a new friend, don't close yourself off. How about that? That's my biggest thing. Don't close yourself off and feel like you're the only person going through something and that you're so isolated. It's so hard for us to reach out for help. And um, that was a really big thing for me as I would close myself off. I have this handled. I don't want anybody to know what I'm going through. Um, I don't want anybody to know that I've kind of lost this light inside of myself. So I think that that would be my message to my 20 year old self. Don't shut yourself off. Don't um, close yourself off to possibility and people and community and help. Don't close yourself off to help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, why is that so hard for us to, to say, um, I just need a break. I just need a little bit of help. I just need somebody to talk to. Um, well, it's interesting because earlier you were talking about the messages that media sends out about drinking and it is a bombardment of messaging that this is how we do celebration. This is how we do stress. This is how we do Yes. Um, sadness. I mean, there's so many labels that are put onto this to try to make us feel like in the space that we're living in is okay, when in reality, it's actually creating a lot of self harm. And a lot of times you see that associated with people, but in reality, it's really isolating. It's really isolating you from people. And it does create, like you said, shame around this because people, especially, you know, when there's a sense of lack of control, there is shame that's associated with it because they may think they have control over it and then they lose the ability to have control over it. And now they're just at the mercy and brought to their knees and trying to figure out the next step. Um, it is a difficult space to live in, but I think your advice to your 20 year old something is very good advice because I remember you saying in the very beginning that you didn't need people 
that was your message that you kept saying to yourself, I don't need people, I can do this. And I think that's one thing that 2020 has really brought to light is that this, you know, this projection of not needing people is false because we really do need one another. This is part of how the human race is wired and how we are built as far as humans, that we do need community, we do need people. And it's interesting when the world shuts down and we're told that we have to socially distance and we have to stay away from each other, how much everybody starts to wake up, literally wake up and have this awakening. I need people, I need a hug, I need social interaction, I need these things. Technology is wonderful but it doesn't give us that human connection of being able to hug another person or that connectedness. And I think that's something that if anybody during 2020 hasn't become cognizant of, it's definitely brought this awareness to people. The other thing I think has really brought awareness to people is this inner work of going inward into our inner spaces. And as you say, you dealt with some of the shadows and you've done some of the work during 2020. And I think that's really amazing, Christy, because most people have been living their life chasing something, right? Whether it's their careers or trying to stand up to this ideal image of what it is that they would be to the world. The stress of that has been compounded with now we are in a pandemic and now we have to live with the circumstances that are outside of our control. And additionally, we're going to be told that this is how we're going to live. We have no control over that. Yeah. So it's interesting because Everybody is in a different place as far as how they're settled in with the grieving of their old life and where they are as far as dealing with today, how they're living today. But what that has done is it has forced people to live with themselves and people don't know how to do that because they've been so busy consuming their life with all these other things that now they're being forced to live with themselves. So when you went into these dark spaces of your life to try to shake up what it was that was happening for you, were you depressed? You said you had these suicidal ideologies. If anybody right now is listening to this and you are suicidal, please, please, please get some community support get the support you need because right now more than ever, people need support. And that does not make you weak to ask for help. So please get that support. But for you, Christy, when you were in this moment of time, what was it that really put light on your situation to make you understand that you were here for a purpose, that you literally are on this planet for a reason was it that god showed up in some way and you know spoke to you or showed you something or how did that kind of evolve for you to help you understand that this was much bigger than just you yeah that's a great question um you know because like we said this is it's been a few years span outside of um you know my journey through addiction and all that, which of course that never ends. They're still in recovery every single day. But I think that it really started at the beginning of this year. Um, just this message, just this message in my head when I would maybe wake up in the mornings of you're here for something bigger, you need to, you need to start connecting with the world. It was just this literal, just this feeling of knowing, um, which is exactly how I also kind of get my downloads and my, um, you know, the things that come to me. It's just this feeling of knowing. It just comes to me that you're here for something. You, um, you're here to help other people, whether it's one person by sharing your story, by highlighting the stories of other people, by just 
start sharing, start talking. Um, that was really the huge message for me this year. And it, it, it comes for me in the forms of just like thoughts. Like I wake up one morning and I'm like, you need to go connect with this person and, or you need to, um, uh, record a podcast about this or go live and talk about this or something. And so by just following those intuitive hits, by just having faith in that voice, in that, um, you know, higher consciousness that's talking to me, just by having faith in that and following it, it has unfolded into just the most incredible journey. So I really feel like that's how it comes for me. It's just this just this knowing, just this, this thought of you're here for more, you're here for more. And that's kind of what carried through me, me through my addiction too. And I don't think that I even realized it at the time was there was almost an invisible force just carrying me through that too, to not, um, to not give up. Yeah. And I think, I think there's, you know, five earth angels called your children that we're probably part of that guiding force because, you know, you're their mom and they needed you, you know, they needed you and they still need you. And that connectedness that you have with your children, I'm sure that was playing a huge part in what was evolving for you. And I, you know, I appreciate so much you sharing your story today because I've had other, um, I've had other shows where I have talked to a recovered addict and I do understand that every day is a process and moment to moment that is a decision. So I do want to congratulate you on your journey and choosing a journey that is healthy and one that is solely meant, you know, living in a space of being healthy because to your point, you have so much to give to the world and anyone listening, I mean, everyone is here for a divine reason and can live in a space of knowing that and knowing that they are fully protected and, you know, are here to do something very special, very unique, even if it's not showing up exactly the way that you want it to. It may not show up exactly the way that you want it to, because it may take time for it to reveal itself. It may take time to show that you have been gifted and experienced because we're preparing you for something else. We're getting you ready to give to the world a much bigger experience because you are going through this experience so that you can teach or tell your story or whatever it is. So Chrissy, I love that you're able to do that. And I just wonder, you know, as far as at one point you had talked about the shame that you felt, I wonder how did you really overcome that hurdle of feeling the shame? Is that primarily just, you know, by getting out in front of people and talking more about your story or what does that look like for you? I would have to say that it's definitely that. Um, just beginning to share my story, I started in a very small kind of safe space. And um, then the response that I got was overwhelming of people reaching out like, thank you for sharing. I'm going through something similar or I've been through something similar or you know, my husband, wife, sister, whoever is going through this too. It became this I really had this fear of being condemned when I started sharing and being judged, but literally it felt like this internal catalyst inside of me. That's like, you have to start sharing, you know, that feeling where you're just like, I don't know what I'm here doing, but I'm just going to start sharing because something is like compelling me so much. It felt literally like that to start sharing my story where I just had to like uh, feel the fear and do it anyways. And then the response from people there was no judging. There was no shaming from anybody else. There was nothing that I had built up in my head about, you know, how, what a horrible monster I was. It was all built up in my head and this fear around what are people going to think? They're going to judge me. And really what it did was help people connect, people connect and say, oh my God, I'm going through something similar or wow, thank you for sharing. I really resonate with you. And it was just, it's, it's been beautiful. Every time that I share, there's no shame. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. It's just pure acceptance. So it's really been beautiful. It sounds, 
really beautiful when you talk about it because I can hear the peace in your voice around it. And I don't hear the shame or fear or any of that. I hear, you know, a lot of peace and serenity. And because it is a day-to-day process and a moment-to-moment decision, I mean, if you ever got into a space where you were like having a difficult day or something happens and you're grappling with the decision, I mean, what is it that really plays the biggest part for you to say, no, I'm not going to take that drink? That's a great question Um, because there's been several times this year, you know, that I've, (laughs) you know, having a really bad day and then you just want to say, oh, forget it. I could just use a, a glass of wine. Um, For me, it's all about catching myself when I say those things and then remembering that it doesn't end up being just one glass or one drink or one sip. For me, it spirals once it's that saying of one's never, one's never enough, but one's also too many. Um, So just, I think for me, it's just remembering where I was, remembering if I do take that drink, where am I going to go back to? You've done so much, you're, you've, created this beautiful life. We're in this space. You have tools, you have community. So it's just remembering um, really where I came from. And I do not want to go back there. I do not want to go back to the feelings, um, you know, that I had every day being sick, going through withdrawals every morning. I really have a heavy picture of that in my mind when I have those thoughts that it's enough of a kind of just snap me out of it and go, oh no, we are not going back there. So for me, it's almost become this very strong, almost recoiling reaction to it when I have those thoughts. And again, that took time to develop. So it's really about having community has been key for me. So wherever it is that you find that, again, AA is great. There's also lots of other spaces um, to connect. And then, you know, just having other coping mechanisms. Um, knowing how to deal better with my emotions when they pop up, knowing that emotions are okay to have and it's, we're going to have emotions. So if you're crying one day and you don't know why, like that's okay, just let it out and honor yourself, give yourself that space. Um, And that was things that I used to not do for myself. So I think that that's really been key for me is just remembering um, where I've come from and having the different coping tools now. Yeah. And and I love your coping tool of just reaching out to your community and your community support team, because a lot of times, you know, in that moment where we're feeling electrocuted with our bodies, because our minds are spiraling and we just take a breath and we call a friend or we call somebody that we know we're safe with and we can fully talk to. I think it does play an integral part in our mental health and well-being. And I really appreciate, you know, you sharing that because, you know, earlier when you had talked about not needing people and not needing the support, I mean, really the, the, the whole storyline here for you is really needing that support and everybody is in that same place. We really do need the connectedness of one another and supporting each other through difficult times. And what better than, you know, a worldwide pandemic to really shine the flashlight on this premise that we as humans really need each other more than ever. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world right now, we need each other. And this you know, message is so, so powerful. So, I mean, Christy, your story, everything, it's so you know, beautiful. And the fact that you're in your recovery and you continue on with this, what are you doing day to day that's really keeping you healthy? and keeping you in this space that you're living in today? Um, For me, it's really, again, about that self-care. And that can look a million different ways. So it's really just making sure that I'm taking care of myself. And, um, you know, self-care, we often think of it as being selfish or, you know, and it's not selfish at all. It's so necessary for you to make sure you're pouring into yourself to make sure that you're getting those meals. I would, you know, find myself in the middle of the day and I'm like, I've been tending to everybody else all day long and I haven't even eaten. It's it's literally as basic as making sure that you're eating, that you're getting what you need, making sure you're getting some kind of um, physical exercise is huge for me, especially 
um, with my mental health as well. I can tell when I start getting away from any kind of exercise that um, my brain gets a little more chatty and likes to tell me a little more things. Um, so not only that, journaling is a really huge thing for me too. Getting the stuff from up here, all that you know, monkey chatter that might be going on in your mind, getting it out and onto paper um, has been a big thing for me too, especially if I'm experiencing some feelings that I'm not really understanding. Why am I feeling this way? Or why is this popping up for me? Sometimes journaling it out um, almost starts an automatic writing process that I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I was holding on to that in my brain. And it just kind of comes out onto the paper. Um, another really big thing for me is just uh, what are you consuming? Being really mindful about um, my media and the things that I'm reading, the things that I'm checking on social media, um, unfollowing people that I had to unfollow, unfollowing news stations has been a really big thing for me right now because they're really bombarding us with so much fear right now that I just have to put it down sometimes. I'm like, I can't swim in that right now because it's, you know, it's like you said, they're trying to they have this whole psychological game going on. Um, so just being really mindful about, yeah, what you're consuming. And that's really what it is. Just taking care of yourself in every little space. It is not selfish. It is so necessary for you. Just make sure you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. And it's so important that you're doing that. And especially, you know, as things continue to evolve and change around the world, paying attention to where you are in the moment and just recognizing the space that you're sitting in and making a decision to do something with it. I think that is so, so vitally important right now because people are really feeling the sense of not having any control because things are being dictated for us and it's not something we're used to. So I think it's it's important to be able to control the things that you can control. And that could be just as simple as, you know, putting some good music on to change your thought process or drinking more water to detox the body, you know, get some of this, this toxin out of your body. I and mean, there's so many things that people can do for self-care. But Christy, thank you so, so much. And I have one last question for you. If I were to find your earth angel feather on the ground and I picked it up, what would your message to the world be? I think that my message would really be as you're not alone, whatever it is that you are going through. I know that it feels really isolating and you feel alone and you maybe feel like nobody could understand or you don't want to share with somebody because you are having that shame or that guilt or that, why am I experiencing this? Most people don't experience this. Just, you're not alone. Um, please don't close yourself off. Please don't um, not allow light to shine in. That would really, really be my message. Reach out, find the help, be open to um, letting others in. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And reaching to the light is always so, so meaningful, especially when you're living in the darkness. So always look for the light. And yes, you're never, ever, ever alone. Um, I couldn't be more, you know, in alignment with that thought process, especially when we're surrounded with earth angels and, and a higher power, we've got, you know, our higher power with us and wherever you are in, in that space spiritually, there's something bigger than yourself that is part of all of this. So yes, you're never alone. Christy, thank you so much. I'm so filled with gratitude for your time today and being with me in the audience. And I, I just so am so appreciative and I, I wish you many, many years ahead with your sobriety and just continued health. But thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for doing what you're doing because this is really important. And so thank you as well. Thank you. And this is Catherine Daniels with Retreat to Peace, reminding you to live your authentic life with peace. And as always, retreat to peace and we'll see you next time.